Hi everybody, I'm Dan Wells. I write horror, fantasy, science fiction, and I talk about games on the internet. Today I am going to talk about a game that's a couple of years old. Uh, it is not an old game by any means. It's still very new and it's still very exciting, but uh, I am definitely behind the times on it. I have only just recently uh, started reading it and playing it and... Uh, like everyone else in the world, I fell in love pretty quickly. Uh, Blades in the Dark by John Harper uh, came out a few years ago, won a thousand awards, and uh, it's really good. <laughs> you should all try this game. Uh, so, kind of the, the conceit, uh, flavor-wise, of Blades in the Dark is that uh, the players are all criminals, in this kind of industrial fantasy town. Uh, there is an electrical field, there's gunpowder, there's clockwork, etc. Kind of Victorian age, actually very Dishonored-esque in, in a lot of ways. Um, but you're not heroes, you're not trying to save the world. You are thugs and murderers, assassins, thieves, etc. who are trying to carve out territory and win turf and uh, just kind of make yourselves rich so you could retire in splendor. And uh, that is already kind of a delightful premise for a game. What I really love about this game, though, is the way that it is structured. Um, it's very narrative. It's very player-driven. Um, it does have a lot of fiddly little mechanics and things, like the way that um, coin works, for example. And that I, I got over that quickly. I, I tend to not like the really fiddly, you have to keep track of all these currencies and units kind of stuff. But it all works, and that's what impresses me the most about this, is it is just seamless. Uh, it is not a generic role-playing system in which you can play anything. Uh, you couldn't uh, adapt this super easily to, you know, a group of heroes who are trying to save the world. You absolutely could. But what it is and what it's trying to do is all part of a piece. It all works together and it all does a very specific job. So what we're going to do... Uh, take a look first at this bad boy right here. So, um, the character sheet. They call the character classes playbooks. Um, they have a reason for calling them playbooks instead of character classes. It doesn't make a ton of sense. Uh, it does not seem significantly different from any other character class in any other game. But... Uh, I will forgive them this uh, quirk. So each one has its own character sheet. So there's the Hound, the Cutter, the Leech, Lurk, Slide, Spider, Whisper, and then you can make up your own thing there. Um, and uh, the reason that each one gets their own is, you know, a lot of games do this, but here it actually makes a lot of sense. So first of all, Okay, let's start at the beginning and explain uh, how this works. So the kind of the, the basic action mechanic of the dice is that you've got these things. I don't know if they call them attributes, but that's what they are. Insight, prowess, and resolve. And then each one has skills attached to it. And so when you uh, roll, so say you want to... Uh, roll command here. He's got one dot in command. So you roll one die. And if it gets a six, you succeed. Um, if it gets a four or five, you succeed, but with a consequence. And if it gets a one, two, or three, you fail. Um, if you are rolling enough dice to get two sixes, one or more sixes, then that is a critical success. So like up here, skirmish, we got two dice there. If they both rolled a six, that would be a critical success. If one of them rolled a one and one of them rolled a four, then that is the highest die is a four or a five, and therefore that is a success with a consequence. 
So that is how the dice mechanic works. If you have no dice in something, like if here I decide to uh, hunt, I don't have any dice, uh, then you roll two dice and you take the lowest one. So it's kind of like rolling with disadvantage in D&D. Um, what's really great about this system is that first of all it's very forgiving. Uh, having one die in command means that I have a 50-50 chance of succeeding at the bare minimum of capacity. It also means that anyone from any class can attempt any roll. So even though I don't have hunt, I could still roll and, you know, it, it's not, the, the odds are against me, but I still could very plausibly succeed. Uh, and then as you start getting more and more, then, you know, more dice, then, then you're getting a lot more likely there. So that's really cool. There's also several ways to add extra dice, but we'll get into that later. So um, that's how the skills work. The uh, special abilities come, yeah, I don't even know how to explain this, this, uh, I don't know where to start, that's the problem. Uh, let's start actually back here. So, uh, this is actually a really neat overview that the, the company made. This comes directly from them and it's on their website, you can get it. Uh, so. This is how the action rolls work, and we explained that, and there's all these different actions. Fortune rolls are just a way of determining something at random. Uh, you know, if you want to know, you know, the, the situation in a room, like when you break in, is there a guard inside? Well, the GM can just decide, or the GM can make a fortune roll. It's just a way of saying, eh, let's figure this out. Resistance rolls. If you are about to take a consequence, and you don't want to, you can choose to take, you can resist it, which gives you stress instead. And so for a resistance roll, you roll whatever the attribute is. So if you're trying to resist physical damage, for example, um, everything here on the left side of the line, I have one die. That's how many dice I have in prowess. So I have a maximum of four dice in each of the attributes if I have at least one point in every skill. Uh, so I would roll this one prowess die, and and obviously a completed character is going to have far more than three skill points assigned, but this is just the this, this starting thing, so that's what I'm using as an example. Um, I would roll this one die in prowess, and um, subtract that. You take six stress minus that die roll, the highest die. And so I might end up taking you know, very little stress, or I might end up taking a lot of stress. If you get too much stress over time, as stress builds up, and stress is marked, where's stress marked? Right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The tenth stress will give you trauma. And trauma is something that you cannot heal from or get rid of. And it will just always be there. And so that is kind of a way of messing you up. But, you know, the alternative to resisting something is that you take damage, you take harm. And there's no, like, hit points or anything. What you have is, you know, if you take a minor consequence, if you take minor harm, it's down here. It doesn't hurt you much. Uh, this is like bumps and bruises. Uh, if you take kind of mid-range harm, then that could be like a broken leg. You you know, are still in trouble, but you're not in super bad trouble, and you start getting minus one die on things. And then if you take serious harm up here, this level three, that uh, is like a punctured lung, like you are in dire and immediate need of help. So harm can be very bad, and there are other consequences that you might want to avoid as well. Like um, one of the things that I love about this game is that everything works together on a, the same kind of system. So if you fail a roll to attack someone, then you might take some damage. If you fail a roll to sneak around, you might set off an alarm. If you fail a roll to run really fast, the bad guy gets away. Those are all consequences. 
and you can avoid those consequences by taking stress instead. And sometimes the consequence is physical harm, sometimes the consequence is that everybody knows you're there, etc., etc. You can avoid all those things. Um, and one of the other really brilliant moves about this is, and the game is very explicit about this, it does not differentiate between roles that take place in the present and roles that take place in the past. And so it encourages you constantly to be doing flashbacks, uh, which I think is really, really fun. Um, and because a lot of the game is about crime, there's a lot of heist, there's a lot of planning, and the, the system allows you to start doing the planning you know, or rather to start doing the mission, to carry out the job, and then do the planning on the fly as necessary. So rather than say, well, we're going to go hit this place, and we're going to try to break in through this window, and we're going to try to make sure we're there when the guards are gone, etc., 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 you just start in medias res. Uh, we're going to do this job, okay, boom, go. And then when you get into a situation, you can say, well, I'm going to sneak past him. Or... You could say, I'm going to uh, say that in the past, I observed this building, and so I know the guard's routes, and we happen to have come at a time when the guard is on the other side of the building, right? So it's this exact same idea. You are circumventing the various trials, and you are rolling dice and skills to do so, um, but some of it takes the form of in-the-moment expertise and some of it takes the form of uh, careful calculated pre-planning and preparation which is again a really cool way of doing it it gets people into the action very quickly um, it uh, divides things up it's really nice so let's go back here to the front so that's how resistance rolls work and that's actually how a ton of other things work and I talked about the flashbacks there um, flashbacks can cost you stress in order to do them but those can often be very worth it, as I explained. So then when you're choosing a character, you will choose a playbook first. Um, and so the cutter is like the thug, the one who deals damage. Hound is the ranger, sort of. They're a tracker and a shooter, sniper. Leech is an alchemist, someone who can do magic and uh, medicine. They're a doctor. Uh, Lurk is the sneaky one. Slide is the uh, the face, the con artist, the uh, talker. Spider, this is the one that intrigued me the most. This is the mastermind, the one who's pulling strings behind the scenes in order to do neat things. Uh, so, for example, their kind of defining special ability here is foresight. Two times per score or job, you can assist a teammate without paying stress. Tell us how you prepared for this. So whether that is something that you're doing in the moment or a flashback, you can do that to help somebody else out and you don't have to pay stress to do it. So you can, you know, that person is trying to sneak past the guards. You can step in and say, oh yeah, I observed this and I timed it out, just like I was ex uh, describing earlier, to help your other uh, players sneak past the guards. Uh, and then Whisper is, this is the magic user. Uh, I said the leech was the magic user only in the sense that alchemy is. This is like actual speaking to ghosts, that sort of thing. Um, and so what each one has, each of these playbooks, you choose a special ability. And the first one in the list is, like I said, a defining special ability. And if you don't know what else to pick, the first one is designed to be a really good one that you can pick and be happy with, but you can choose any of them. So, uh, you know, this cutter, they're defining one Battleborn. You can expend your special armor, which is right here. You just check that off and say, I have used my special armor to reduce harm from an attack in combat or to push yourself during a fight. Uh, and that just happens automatically. You don't have to roll to resist. You can just reduce the harm and you're good. Um, or you can choose, maybe you want this bodyguard thing so you can protect teammates. Maybe you want ghost fighters so that you can fight against ghosts because this takes place in like a scary, haunted, uh, industrial hell. Um, load limits. Mule is a special ability where your load limits are higher. Light 5, normal 7, heavy 8. What that means is over here. 
I really like the load system in this game as well. This is gear. And again, as with the skill rolls, you are able to make gear selections after a job is already started. And every time you need something, you know how like in a James Bond movie, uh, at the beginning of the thing, he walks through Q's uh, headquarters, the laboratory, and Q's like, well, I got you this watch that's a magnet, and I got you this car that's a submarine, and I got you this pen that's a bomb. And then those happen to be the three exact things that Bond needs in order to solve the problems that he ha that he encounters uh, in the course of the movie. That's kind of how this works. Because you don't have to pick what they are in advance. What you do at the start of a job is you say, well, I am going to go with a light load or a normal load or a heavy load. And the difference is that light load you can conceal. You can walk around in the city with a light load and nobody knows that you're, you know, packing guns or, or whatever weapons and gear you have, okay? You just look like a normal person. Normal means someone who looks at you can tell that you have some gear on you, that you're looking for trouble. They can see your weapon. If you have armor, they can see your armor, etc. They don't necessarily immediately suspect you. You don't look like, uh, you know, a, a paramilitary lunatic with full body armor and assault rifle going to Home Depot. Uh, but you do look like people can tell that you've got a bunch of stuff. Heavy, that's the paramilitary lunatic with an assault rifle at Home Depot. You've got so much gear that everyone who sees you can tell that you are out looking for trouble, ready to cause a ruckus. And so, depending on the needs of the job, each member of the team chooses what kind of load they have. And then, you know, those choices will inform the rest of it. One of the examples that they use in the book is that they're going to sneak into a building and they've worked it out so that they aren't going to have to be seen by anybody. So it doesn't matter and they can all just take a normal load. They don't have to hide with the light load. Uh, it may be that you can decide the slide on your team, that face man talking character. Uh, she's going to go in with a light load so that nobody suspects her of anything. But then you've got your cutter with a heavy load waiting, you know, in the back closet, ready to break out and bust some heads. And, you know, you can decide how that goes. And then as things happen through the course of the score or the job or the adventure, you can say, well, I'm really going to need um, armor for this. And so, boom, boom, you check off these two blocks of armor. And then you're like, well, uh, we need to climb this... Uh, wall so it's a good thing i brought my climbing gear and then you check off the two boxes of climbing gear that's already four so if you're in a normal load you've only got one left so if you get into a fight then you grab a blade or two or you grab a pistol or you grab an unusual weapon any one of these like one things or you just say well after i climb this wall i need to break into that uh, window so i have burglary gear and then you just have to hope you don't get into a fight because there's no load left for you to take a weapon so love that whole system and you know the reason we started talking about this is the cutter's got this ability where even he can you know, he can take five with a light load he can go all the way up to heavy uh eight with a heavy load you know so there's uh two points of armor three more to get extra heavy armor and then still have three left to get some weapons or whatever you need demolition tools etc now uh the next thing you choose a heritage. There are no, to my knowledge, mechanical um, powers associated with the heritages. Uh, if you want to be from Akaros, if you want to be from the Dagger Isles, Iruvia, Severos, Skavlan, Ticheros, these are all part of the world building, and they're explained in detail, and we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, but mostly it is just for flavor purposes, and it will modify roles. Like, if you choose to be Skovlin, that is not going to give you, like, a special power or an attribute bonus or anything like that. What it will do is that when you're dealing with, you know, other Skovlanders, you have a bonus to your interactions with them. And when you're dealing with somebody really fancy and, uh, you know, upper crust, 
they don't really like the Scovlanders much, and so maybe they will treat you more poorly. So it's, uh, it's not a direct mechanical effect. Uh, after that, you will choose your background. And these are interesting, and they're actually, you know, several of these, and they will change what you do, what you're capable of, where you come from, etc. Um, then you assign your four action dots. So, whoa, come on, come on. There we go. Cutter starts with these three action dots, gets to assign four more anywhere you want. And uh, if you look in the book, there are actually specific guidelines that you can follow if you want. Like if you want to be an assassin, pick these four. If you want to be, uh, you know, a former mercenary or even a current mercenary, pick these four. If you want to be just a dockside bruiser, pick these four. So th th there's a lot of really flavorful ways to sculpt your character based on how you do that. Um, then you choose your special ability, which we talked about already. Then you choose a close friend and a rival. These are here. Now, the world building of the game is so specific. The uh, city that you work in is called Duskwall or Doskwall. And uh, there's all, it's already filled uh, with factions, with people, with specific places. There's incredibly detailed maps of everything. And so it goes so far as to just name these. And you don't have to choose these if you want. You can come up with other things. But basically what you do here is you will go through and you will say, uh, you pick one of these as a friend and you kind of fill in the upward pointing triangle and you choose one of these as a rival and fill in the downward pointing triangle. So if you want Marlene the Pugilist to be your friend, you know, like maybe you used to be a boxer or maybe you used to train boxers, and so you've got Marlene is your buddy. But then you uh, have dealt in the past with, let's say, Mercy, a cold killer, uh, someone that you know you have run into before on your jobs, or you compete for the same jobs, or you had to beat Mercy up at some point, or Mercy had to beat you up at some point. You've tried to kill each other in the past, so you've got a friend who can be a valuable contact, and you've got a rival who can cause trouble. Uh, and I like that system a lot. Then you choose your vice. The vice is really interesting to me as well. And where are the vices? Right here. Uh, and so you write down who the vice is and where, you know, who is the purveyor of your vice. And as with the friends and the rivals, you can make that up or you can look through the book and say, oh, well, here, this guy runs the tavern. My vice is uh, pleasure, alcohol, and that's where I typically get it. And the reason that the vice is so valuable is because that's where you get rid of uh, stress. So let's say that your vice is stupor. You just want to drink yourself into a stupor or, you know, drug yourself or whatever it is to... Uh, take away the pain of your existence. And so when your stress gets really high, then in between missions during what's called downtime, uh, then you can choose as one of your downtime activities indulging in a vice, which means you go off to that opium den and you just put yourself into a ridiculous stupor and that gets rid of a bunch of your stress so that you are fresh and ready to go for the next, uh, the next score, the next mission. Uh, really like that system a lot. Uh, last of all, you write down your name, your alias, your look, and uh, you know that's just kind of what you look like. All makes a lot of sense. There's good things here. Um, also, and I didn't explain this when I was talking about load. Each playbook has a specific, you know, list of stuff they can get that nobody else can get. So like if you want a particularly scary weapon or a tool, you can mark that. Uh, anyone else who wants a weapon just has, you know, a blade or something like that. You've got something extra nasty. Or you can click this thing to have Rage Essence, which is like a drug that fires you up and makes you scarier in combat. Or you can have this uh, Manacles and Chains. 
uh, and there's that's not on anybody else's load list. So a lot of the specifics of this game feel very board gamey to me uh, in a good way. Like if you were going to play a dungeon crawl board game and you're like, well, I only have so many equipment slots and this is what I'm going to put in there. Um, or I'm going to you know, keep track of different things that I have and how many actions and, and that sort of thing. It feels like that in practice, playing through it, it all kind of fades into the background and it really feels liberating. Um, you you have much more freedom to do things and how you choose to do things in Blades in the Dark than you do in a lot of other role-playing games uh, in a way that I think will be shocking and uh, really eye-opening to people who have never played a narrative game before. This straddles that line really well between kind of gamist and narrativist. It's, it's a lot of fun. So uh, let's talk then about, let's go back here to this book, um, and let's talk about the score. Um, because there are lots of different kinds of jobs that you can undertake, and the way the game is structured, there isn't really like a, a long-term campaign story. Uh, your game master doesn't have to come up with a really complicated uh, or intricate story to tell because it is all driven by the players. When you sit down for a game session, you you know the players are the ones who say, well, you know, based on this and based on that, we we need more money or we need more reputation or we need to uh, follow up on this lead. Um, and so then they choose what they're going to do. And maybe that means they're going to sneak in and steal something. Maybe that means they're going to go just claim some turf from a rival gang that's getting too close. You know, whatever it is, there's a job, a score that they are going to do. And once that is made, then you immediately make the engagement roll. And this was the biggest hurdle for me just because I am such an advanced planner, but I talked about this a little bit already. Uh, the game just throws you into the middle of it. You make an engagement roll, uh, which is based on you know a couple of factors, and there's a couple of modifiers for it. And you basically just say, okay, we're going to go and we're going to steal this artifact from this cathedral, make the engagement roll, and then you're there. The engagement roll will determine how well you've planned, and the state of the cathedral when you get there to steal from it. And so if you roll really well, that means, you know, that you have a, you know, a secret way in, or something is good. If you roll really poorly, maybe that means that there's, you know, a bunch of armed guards there waiting for you, whatever it is, however you decide to work that out. Uh, and then you go through, and you have the chance to try to overcome all these obstacles to fulfill your stated goal, which in this case is stealing an artifact from that cathedral. And the game master's just there kind of facilitating this, filling in the holes where necessary, interpreting the dice rolls to help you as the players do what you set out to do. And then at the end, if you get what you want, then hooray, uh, there's some benefits for that. You can get some coin, you can get some reputation, maybe you have claimed new turf, uh, if you have failed, then maybe you've lost some coin, you've got some consequences to deal with, uh, etc. Um, you can do one or you know, sometimes even two scores per session fairly easily, and then you go into downtime. And downtime, everyone gets two downtime activities. And so the first thing you do in downtime is the payoff. You get the rewards from your successfully completed score. Uh, heat you accumulate heat based on how, you know, are the cops mad at you, are other gangs mad at you, etc. Entanglements, uh, what sorts of other events occur? And these can be things like maybe other gangs are, are deciding to get up in your face or, or maybe you were seen by a cop or whatever. And there's a really fun little table to roll on for that. 
and then downtime activities. And the downtime activities themselves, let me see if I can find that. Um, there's, you know, acquiring assets, doing a long-term project, which could be researching something or trying to crack open a, a safe that you've stolen and can't get, get into, things like that. Recovering, uh, reducing heat, training, and indulging vice. The two ways to reduce heat are, as a downtime activity, you can work really hard to get rid of it, but that's slow and costly. Alternately, you can just go to jail, and there's pretty, you know, you're, you have a wanted level, and uh, you can get rid of wanted levels by going to jail. I guess incarceration gets rid of, uh, of wanted levels more so than it does by heat, but it does clear all your heat. Anyway, um... This thing in there, the, um, that's not what I wanted to see. I wanted to look at the, and now it's frozen. There we go. So I wanted to look at the faction game, because that is the part that is most exciting to me, um, by far, the way that the factions all work together. And so... Is it Duskfall? Yeah, here we go. So, the city that you take place in is this kind of haunted industrial fantasy land. Like I said, there's ghosts everywhere. Um, there's all this weird kind of energy. And there's a lot of really fun world building in here. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but, then you have these very specific factions. Uh, there's the map. I'm trying to find the faction list. Oh, this is going to take forever because it goes through all the whole map. I want to see the whole map. PDF. I want to see the factions. Here we go. So, there's one sentence descriptions of each of them. There are um, very detailed descriptions of each of them including you know what territory they control uh what they're what they're trying to do what they hope to accomplish different quirks who their other allies and enemies are and so you go through this whole thing and again the players are the ones who are controlling this you see these tiers here the um the players start with a tier zero gang and part of what you're trying to do is, like I said, you're basically just accumulate enough money so that you can retire. And, um, oh, that's not even what I wanted to look at. Anyway, so you can start off by attacking some of the other gangs that are at or near your tier level. And then slowly build your way up as you gain reputation, as you gain power. Uh, you can start attacking bigger and bigger targets. And so... I say that the game doesn't have an overarching story. It does. It is the story of your crew trying to conquer the you know, criminal element of Duskwall. And you're going to face off against rival gangs and against the police and against the military and against all these other special interests that are hanging around in there. And all of them are clearly delineated. And so based on how you put together your characters and based on how you put together your crew, you will be facing off against you know specific other groups. You can choose to target some of them. You can make friends with some. You can go to war with some. Uh, and there's this just beautiful little system where you know you add up the heat and you add up the reputation and you have faction scores against not every single faction in the game, but the pertinent ones, the ones that you interact with. What are they doing? And what are they doing in the background? Like the Red Sashes here, they want to destroy the Lamp Blacks. The Lamp Blacks are a rival gang that, surprise, wants to destroy the Red Sashes. And so they're working against each other, and you can decide to step in and help one of them. Maybe you want to ally with one. Maybe you want to just let them destroy each other and then take all their territory. But these clocks are happening in the background. You know, and once eight spots on this clock have been ticked off, then the thing that they're trying to accomplish will happen. 
unless the players have stepped in at some point to change it, to speed it up, to slow it down, to redirect it in some way. Uh, so here they want to become Ward Boss of Crow's Foot, which is like the the seedy part of town, the, the criminal element part of town. They want to take it over, um, but that's also what you want to do. So you'll inevitably be in conflict with them, um, regardless of uh, you know whether you have tried to make friends with them in other ways or not. So the faction game is really what, more than anything else, sells me on Blades in the Dark. Uh, the ability for the players to be in charge and to say, well, I want to do this, I want to attack that group, I want to take over this thing, and then letting them guide the story and watch this really interesting story emerge around the characters based on their own decisions. They are the protagonists, or in many ways the antagonists, of the story that is happening, right? They're a criminal group trying to take over a city. They're the villains of the story. It makes sense that we give them full agency to start doing whatever they want. Um, as far as the other people, um, I kind of hinted at this earlier. Very similar to the way that Spire works. Uh, the dice mechanic, the action mechanic here. Um, you don't roll for the bad guys. Uh, you don't have to you know figure out what their stats are and then roll to see if they hit because like I was explaining with the action dice when you roll a consequence then you will take a consequence so if you're trying to attack somebody you know you run into a bar to rough up some rivals and you roll a four that's your highest die on your brawl or skirmish or wreck or whatever skill you're using uh, that means that you have succeeded, but with a consequence. So you beat up the other guy, but you took a little bit of damage yourself. And so all of this stuff, and I love this in Spire, and I love it here, all of the enemy actions are tied up in the player's own dice rolls. So it's very quick playing in that sense. A combat doesn't take forever because... It can all be resolved in just a couple of rolls from one side, and everything works together really well. Anyway, um, the world building in Blades in the Dark is great. The uh, dice mechanic is great. The faction game is phenomenally well done and interesting. The way that uh, the different groups interact with each other and the way that the player characters get to interact with rivals and find allies and create enemies and tell their own story and guide their own progress as they go through. They're basically, in, in many ways you could say that Blades in the Dark is just a model engine of how Duskwall works and then the players can use that to do anything they want, uh, to try to gain more power Maybe they want to kill all their rival gangs. Maybe they want to, uh, you know, set up some little businesses like gambling dens or, or bars where they can start earning more money. Maybe they want to get all their money by stealing it. Or maybe they want to start accepting, you know, tribute from other gangs. However they want to do it, they can. And it is really fun and really clever. And I've talked far too long about it explaining you know how the characters work and everything um but trust me this game is fantastic and i recommend it super highly so blades in the dark go check it out anyway thank you for watching this video um i'm dan wells i write a lot of books i play a lot of games i'm a professional game master and i can run a game or campaign for you including this one uh anyway Thanks for watching. I'm Dan Wells, and you are awesome.